But once we commit, we commit very much for the long term. Uh, through the ups and downs, uh, we tend to lead rounds, uh, coming in very early at uh, you know Series A typically, sometimes seed, sometimes pre-seed, and um, just uh, signing on for sometimes ten plus years of of service. Welcome, Matt Turk. Hello, thanks uh, very much for having me on the Software Engineering Daily. I'm excited for it. Yeah, it's um, really a pleasure to have you. I know that you've had a lot going on lately, so we've got a lot to cover. But before we do, um, maybe you can talk a little bit about um, you know what your background and what you do. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm uh, currently a partner at FirstMark. FirstMark is an early stage venture firm based in New York. Usually one of the rare uh, native New York venture firms. Um, and uh, before that, I was an entrepreneur. I uh, co-founded a company back in the day that did enterprise search uh, using a lot of uh, AI techniques. Uh, so like it would now be a, a hot AI company. But at the time, I remember having to convince my, my, my now like VC peers that like AI was, was still a thing. It was, you know, in the middle of, a, of an AI winter. So anyway, I did that for a few years. Uh, the company was eventually acquired by Oracle. I joined Oracle as part of the acquisition, did a tour of duty there, um, essentially on the product and sort of sales enablement side, taking you know our little product and putting it in the in the big Oracle machine. And then I left to uh, effectively switch to the uh, investing and, and incubation to some extent side uh, by uh, joining Bloomberg LP uh, and help start Bloomberg Ventures, uh, the, the first incubation and, uh, and the investment effort there. Uh, and then uh, got a chance to uh, you know, know the first mark folks and then uh, organically that led to an opportunity to join the partnership that was still very young and early at the time. Uh, and again, as I said, I've been there 10 years now, which has been a, a wonderful journey. That's great. Amazing background. Um, so you didn't start out directly thinking you were going to be an investor. You started out thinking you were going to be a software developer or an entrepreneur? An, an entrepreneur, yes. That was the, 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 the thrill and the promise of the uh, you know, adventure of uh, being an entrepreneur that uh, uh, draw me into tech. I mean, you know, I look by, by, by way of extended family background, my, my dad uh, was for decades uh, a software entrepreneur in France, uh, and uh, it, was, it was pointed out to me repeatedly uh, that uh, for a number of years I said I didn't want to do anything that I had to do with uh, computers growing up, and ironically ended up being a software entrepreneur myself. Uh, but, you know, like the way my, my dad did it uh, was the the hard way, you know, especially seen now from a, an investor angle, you know, back uh, in France in the 70s and 80s, uh, when he was an entrepreneur, there was just no venture capital whatsoever. So he basically built a software company uh, just uh, completely bootstrapped and through services uh, over time, which when you, when, you, when you think about it, obviously, there's a number of companies uh, around the world and in the US in particular that are bootstrapped with like the level of like effort and grit that's involved in building a product company uh, without any kind of backing is just tremendous. That's really interesting. What do you think? Why do you think he told you not to do technology entrepreneurship? He he, he uh, didn't tell me as much as uh, that was uh, you know my, my takeaway. I think that's you know that's always a little bit of like you know being a teenager and sort of like being in awe of your parents, but also sort of rebelling. You know, we're going back many years now. Um, but uh, I think you know the, the, the my, my experience being the kid of an entrepreneur was that. It's pretty damn hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, you know, he would leave very early and come back very late and spend uh, many, many hours during the weekend just in his office working. And I could see the stress of it on the on the daily basis. And I just didn't look fun at all. So he was very passionate and, uh, you know, ended up doing uh, pretty amazing things when I look back now in, in hindsight. Uh, but, uh, you know, as a family member, I got to, to see uh, the sheer level of effort that's uh, involved in it. something that, uh, you know, we, we as, a, as, a, as a almost like an entrepreneurial culture occasionally talk about, but not, you know, that often. And the whole, you know, mental health and the whole 
um, you know, toll that uh, being an entrepreneur takes on the people around you is uh, something that's very uh, much uh, non non trivial. And you know, again, my, my dad all did, I did that remarkably and, and all the things. But uh, it's 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 really quite something that you know beyond the glamour and the the tweets and the TechCrunch articles and the fundraising and all the things. The the sheer just like impact is just tremendous. You know, I'm really glad you're talking about that. I think sometimes we do romanticize um, what it takes to really be a founder. And, um, you know, it makes me think of Olympic athletes. They love their sport. They do it because they love it. They can't love getting up at 5 a.m. to run their, swim their laps or whatever. You don't love every minute of it. It takes a lot of yeah. grit. Um, and so it's interesting that you share that story because um, First Mark has a particular point of view about relationships uh, with um the companies you invest in. Do you want to share a little bit of that? Because I, I kind of think about like the loneliness of being a founder and that's almost something you guys address. Yeah, absolutely. Look, uh, we, we um, in some ways we practice venture capital um, in some ways the, the old and traditional way, which was, uh, you know, very much not cool to talk about last year or two years ago when the market was super frothy. Uh, but suddenly is uh, you know you know what becoming very cool again, and by that I mean that um, we uh, are not trying to do all things to all people. Uh, we're not trying to be a multi-stage, multi-location, multi-strategy kind of firm. And look, there are a bunch of, co- of firms that do what I just described very well. So it's it's just. Uh, um, you know, it's just not the way we go about it. The way we go about venture capital is this model of uh, not making uh, too many investments a year. So we're in that very classic, uh, you know, two to three uh, investments per partner per year, uh, which, um, you know, in a world where we see thousands of opportunities, each one of us a year is, it leads to incredibly difficult choices and very often uh, bad decisions uh, or you know, uh, missing opportunities that, that comes with the territory of, of, of doing that and, and for everyone and, and we know exception. Uh, but once we commit, we commit very much for the long term uh, through the ups and downs. Uh, we tend to lead rounds uh, coming in very early at uh, you know, series A typically, sometimes seed, sometimes pre-seed. And um, just uh, signing on for sometimes 10 plus years of, of service. Uh, and when we invest in a business, it's certainly uh, the partner making the investment, uh, but it's also the whole firm. Uh, ultimately, we're a small group and a tight partnership. And um, we have uh, a fantastic platform team. And, you know, platform is one of the things where, uh, you know, 10 years ago, it was kind of like original and now like everybody and their brother has a, has a platform. But we're very proud uh, about the way uh, we do it. And like in some ways, my partner, Dan Kozikowski, who leads uh, the effort around platform at the firm, is one of the pioneers in the industry. Um, and we do that, you know, it's, 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 it's a long discussion, but fundamentally we believers in building networks. Uh, and uh, those are networks of customers, networks of potential talent, networks of uh, uh, corporate, um, uh, you know, friendly corporates who can be partners in all the things. And uh, we have, uh, you know, a hundred different ways we leverage this for the benefit of the portfolio. But several of our founders, actually many of our founders have remarked uh, over the years that when you partner with Firstmark, you don't work with just uh, an investment professional, uh, but you have a whole team working for you, which is something we, we're proud of. Interesting. Um, as you go back to the idea of platforms, um, let me ask you, how are you guys definition, you know, the definition of I've worked in platform software, I think, but a definition seems to change depending on who you're talking to. Um, how do you guys think about what is a platform play? So, you know, platform is one of those terms that depending on the industry or even the sub-segment of the industry means lots of different things. So like we, we mean it in a, um, you know, sort of in a venture capital way, meaning uh, we think of platform as effectively post-investment support. And the way we uh, do it, uh, you know, the, wh- when you just talk about what we do, uh, you know, it seems in some ways very obvious. Uh, what's much harder is how you execute on it on a daily basis. But uh, at a high level, you know, what do companies need? 
Um, so uh, again, we specialize mostly in the series A, the series A stage, a little bit of, of earlier stuff. But like you know, between the between the A and the B, uh, that's uh, when you have very precise needs around talent. Where, for example, you'll probably at some point bring in your first uh, head of finance. So before that, you don't need a head of finance. And between the A and B is really the moment when uh, actually you start you should start building infrastructure uh, around finance and, and, and back office, which very often is a non-intuitive uh, thing for founders to think. The, the question is, is, is very often, well, you know, what would they do all day? And so that's, uh, you know, one of the well, things... Uh, one of the things we do, so like we have our, you know, the talent part of our platform and we've recruited many heads of finance over the years. And uh, we happen to also have a professional, a private professional community that we call the Guild uh, around finance. And we actually have a Guild around, you know, marketing, consumer and, and, and B2B. And we have a Guild around people and we have a Guild around product and we have a Guild around CTOs. Uh, and all of that's, you know, that's one of the many ways where we have multiple networks that feed into our talent network. Um, and then we have a network, uh, you know, so a company is a series any talent. They also need customers. So we have a long list of like people that we that we know uh, for many, many years. And that's one of the beautiful things about being in New York is that all the global 2000 companies and many of the very large tech companies have a very significant office. Sometimes they're headquartered. You know, that's what traditionally New York has been great for. That's where all the customers are. Uh, but even if they're headquartered in different parts of the country, they tend to have, you know, uh, sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands, sometimes in the case of, of Google, tens of thousands of people in New York. And day in and day out, we just go and talk to whoever will want to talk to us. So as a result, we have this uh, tremendous uh, you know, a footprint of friends and people we know in different companies uh, that, again, like join our guilds. That's one of the ways this works. And uh, that enables us also to like to turn and say, hey, uh, you know, when we make an investment, here are 10 or I don't know, 15, 20 companies that you should talk to that we know this is a friendly introduction. And uh, because they're friendly, not only they could become uh, a early customer or design partner, but they will give you feedback and they will pay attention because you're not just some random person. Like we made the introduction as part of our network. So I could go on and on, but that's, you know, talent, it's uh, uh, the corporate network, and then it's a whole like series of events, which we think as largely expertise network where we run, uh, historically we've run a hundred events per year. Um, and, um, uh, you know, with the pandemic that slowed down a bit, now that we post pandemic, uh, knock on wood, uh, we are now back to doing like events all the time. And there are, there are private communities and we talk about the guild. There are public communities like Data Driven NYC, which is uh, my own community that I've been running for 10 years now, which is, you know, over the years, it became the largest uh, sort of data and AI meetup in the country. And uh, that's also one part of the overall arsenal. You had, um, I'm going to come back a little bit to your philosophies around investing, but um, since you mentioned it, Data Driven New York, you had a very exciting launch of the new MAD just recently. Yes. Uh, yeah. For people uh, who so, so, yeah, the, yeah. The, 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 yeah, no, thank you for mentioning uh, it's, it's uh, you know. The, 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 the MAD is a, a labor of love. Uh, I mean, Data Driven NYC is a labor of love, but like the MAD is another sort of like uh, labor of love, like I've been doing for a number of, uh, a number of years. And so what the MAD is, um, is an annual landscape of the data, machine learning and AI um, ecosystem. And um, that's the, the centerpiece of it is uh, that uh, kind of like market map, which um, <laughs> Started with uh, you know a few dozen companies and now has literally uh, you know fourteen hundred companies on it and um, so I've I've been on a on an annual cadence of doing this and it's uh, it feels like a bigger effort every every year. This year was like particularly uh, particularly gnarly, uh, but the big innovation this year is that we now have um, in addition to the PDF and the you know series of blog posts that goes around the the, the landscape itself, we have an interactive version. So if people go to mad.firstmarkcap.com, so mad.firstmarkcap.com, you'll, you'll have a, a version you can play with and sort of click on the logos. And that gives you uh, some information provided by our friends at CB Insights about the, the companies and all the things. So that's the, yeah, that's the Mad just came out. Check it out. 
Um, I will. I have to I offer you a personal thank you. About five years ago when I got started really focusing, you know, I come from the software side, started really focusing on data. I was like, somebody out there must have created a landscape so I can get on high ground here and picture this thing. And yes. I, uh, you're, for, you know, one of the previous versions made me look smarter than I am, which I... Oh, that's awesome. Like, look, I, 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 I'm, I'm very grateful for your, you know, mentioning this. This is great. It's a great resource, I think, and I would recommend it for um, product managers who are doing strategy. It's so important to get on higher ground, I think, um, as a product manager when you're creating roadmap, understanding how, even if you don't agree with it all, understanding how people might bucket or think about the categories is super helpful. The other thing that I think is interesting is that it also advances a point of view for you as an investor, which helps maybe entrepreneurs are getting started to understand where this thing's going, not just what the snapshot is right now. You had a couple new categories that you added this year that I'd love to just touch on real quick, um, if that's okay for, with you. Yeah. And just to be specific, I'm talking about the GPU accelerated databases, vector and database abstraction. Uh, do yeah. you just tell me a little bit about why you're adding those and what you, what you think the futures are short and long term? Yeah, absolutely. So look, uh, all, all those categories, uh, ebb and flow, and that's a little bit uh, the purpose of the exercise is to see what's uh, been happening in different parts of the ecosystem and what the trends are. And uh, sometimes we add categories, sometimes we remove categories. Actually, in fact, every year we add and remove some categories, um, including some recent categories that look like they were the beginning of a trend. And then for whatever reason, that doesn't pan out or that gets um, uh, you know swallowed up by other big companies that effectively destroy the category. So, so there's a little bit of a like new stuff, uh, you know, every year. And there. you can so, do like a know, shadow landscape of the stuff that fell out. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's a, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. Uh, actually, there's probably an animation about like how that evolves over the years, uh, which uh, we could do at um, at some point. So. Um, yeah, those are some of the uh, exciting categories. So, look, GPU database, that's more of um, a recategorization of, uh, we used to have a GPU cloud uh, category that we split up in two. So, like, th that's not uh, particularly new, but, um, uh, you know, the, the, the part of GPU databases that's used for machine learning, that's, uh, you know, obviously getting uh, traction with um, the whole... Uh, uh, just crazy exponential growth of uh, generative AI and, and all the things. Uh, vector database that's truly a net new one, uh, and that's uh, you know this uh, emerging category of. Um, uh, databases that focus on unstructured data uh, for purposes of uh, powering machine learning and AI. So that's uh, you know th those companies are getting uh, all of a second a lot of attention. As all things, it's always uh, you know unclear whether that's the right way of solving this problem versus another way that could emerge in the future. So it's all very much like early stage. Uh, a lot of those companies are still seed Series A, Series B companies, as opposed to being your you know your your Series D or pre IPO company. So uh, it's it's all emerging, but that's that's uh, interesting. So we highlighted the. Uh, a few Pinecone, uh, Zilli's, Quadrant, uh, you know, Zilli's being the company um, that um, commercial company on top of the Milvis um, uh, open source project. So in the landscape, there is a separate open source category, which is at the bottom. So we tend to put the commercial entity in the in the upper categories and then we put the open source project at the at the bottom. But that's so that's an interesting one. And then, uh, yeah, certainly database abstraction. Um, that's another category we 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 added this year and I I actually don't even really know if that's a perfect term for it but like what we wanted to capture was like this emerging group of database or, or database kind you know uh, players database ish uh, players um, that effectively uh, focus on making it much easier and simpler for developers to uh, do anything on the back end so mm -hmm. by pushing away the complexity, so, uh, you know, obviously they're all pretty much all of them serverless, um, but uh, they, they're very, um, uh, you know, they, they'll cover different things. So, uh, you know, in, 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 in particular, I'm a recent and proud investor in a company called Surreal DB, which is a, an extremely fast growing um, open source project. Uh, that does all of the above and, you know, as a combination of, of, of graph and document. Um, so it covers, you know, different parts of the, of the world and different problems. Like in a, in a, in a, 
in a, in a in a world where like the traditional way of thinking about things has been that it's very hard to combine different categories and you had to have the SQL databases and then the NoSQL databases and the graph databases. Uh, you know, all of this is starting to merge together, or at least there's a layer that enables all of this to to merge. So I, I think that's uh, super. Uh, interesting, and there's like a whole category like Zata and Superbase, and you know, going back to the sort of like Firebase day, was, uh, that was probably the the early yeah. version of all of this. Uh, but um, you know, and then you have companies uh, that I'm also an investor in, um, like Cockroach, uh, that. Um, you know, take the SQL uh, world, but like give it the um, scalability characteristics of the NoSQL world. Uh, and they all, also come up with a serverless version of this. So, you know, this whole space is just um, is just uh, fascinating and evolving in all sorts of interesting ways. But I, I think the, the overarching trend is a trend towards uh, functional consolidation of like less products doing more and being more of the best of both worlds or multiple worlds and making it overall easier for the developer to um to do what they need to do uh you know an another yet another example in all of this would be uh, uh you know a low edb that was uh, launched by google recently which is you know this into that intersection of transactional and all app um which uh, look like other players do um uh, as well that's and like, that's an whole idea new, that's so the that's new getting, harness, right yeah but that's getting uh, that's getting more more attention now um, so yeah, that, that that part, like that whole infrastructure side, which is on the left side of the of the mat, is like plenty plenty happening. We might have to edit this back because I think I asked this these questions a little bit backwards. For those who don't know, what is the mad and why did why do you make it? Yeah, so the the mad, um, so the 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 mad is stands for machine learning, um, AI, and data. It's an annual landscape that I've been doing for. Uh, 10 plus years now, and um, the general idea is that it's, it's a suite of different things. The, the core piece is uh, a market map, so it's one of those charts with uh, lots of categories and lots of little logos. Uh, around it, I write a series of blog posts around, uh, you know, trends. So, so there's uh, one blog post about trend in data infrastructure. There's another blog post on trends on machine learning and AI. Uh, there's one around sort of financing IPOs uh, and m and And all of it is meant to be a little bit of a state of the union of that entire space that I've been covering for, for many years that um, I think is a very good um, starting piece for... Uh, anybody trying to learn more about the space or anybody that may be very familiar with a small part of this whole thing, but is looking to understand how that fits into the broader uh, landscape. So it's not meant to be a deeply, deeply technical, uh, in the weeds uh, kind of uh, kind of piece on every single subject. It's much more like a sort of an ensemble kind of a piece that enables people to understand at a good level of detail uh, the the big picture, and then as uh, as I mentioned for the first year this year, uh, as part of that suite, the blog post, the PDF. Now we also have an interactive version at mad uh, firstmarkcap dot com, which is uh, a great way to navigate it. Because <laughs> obviously, every year I get the the comments, especially as the landscape gets fuller and fuller. Everybody's like, okay, well, I need. Uh, uh, you know, I need a magnifying glass to be able to like see all the logos, which um, of course I understand. So not only you can zoom in the the PDF because it's all everything is very high resolution, but now this year uh, you can use the interactive version where you can uh, zoom in to like 150 or 200 percent, and like hopefully you can uh, get to see everything very clearly. It looks amazing, and it does help give context. Uh, suggestion for next year: you could gamify it in some way. <laughs> No. I've, been, I've, been, I've been thinking about the premium version where like I finally get paid for the thing and I uh, you know like a logo placement uh, exactly. or, or maybe yeah or maybe I do sell, sell the magnifying glasses uh, oh yeah uh, that's the upsell, viewer, so, the viewer. Exactly. Um, like a premium uh, premium version where you get the landscape for free but you have to pay it for to be able to actually see it to zoom in <laughs> um, so I want to ask a little bit about you know we've got a lot of folks who listen to the podcast who are probably interested in founding a company at some point they might be technical founders so I want to ask you a little little bit about that and then like we'll hear a little bit about like what you're looking at in the market so just starting with your advisory kind of air, uh, thoughts a um, couple things I work with a lot of people who tell me they're very talented software developers or talented MBA students who tell me well I want to start a company but I have to wait 
till I get a partner, either a business partner or a tech partner. Um, I have to wait until I have the best idea, not just this one idea. What are the, like when you're looking at pre a early, early stage, what are some of the things like, what's the minimum you would need as a founder to start talking about it? Yeah, so it's, it's a little bit of a nuanced conversation and uh, that could be a very long conversation, but there's this a little bit of a fine line between um, not waiting too long uh, and rushing. Uh, so waiting too long is a typical issue where a lot of people have um, almost fantasies. I'm, I'm saying this in a, in a loving way, but like I've... I have a fantasies of one day being an entrepreneur, but really um, keep thinking, well, that's hard. I'll never be ready um, or not ready yet. And maybe in two years and maybe in three years. And then, you know, life happens. And before you know it, uh, you make too much money uh, to want to take the pay cut or um, you have a family or whatever reason, right? So there, there is a window uh, during which it's easier. By all means, you can be an entrepreneur and a founder at any age. And uh, you know the dirty secret uh, of venture capital is that for all the celebration of youth and uh, you know Collison's at Stripe and the Zuckerbergs at uh, Facebook uh, or Bill Gates starting companies when they were teenagers, uh, the reality is that uh, most uh, successful companies actually started by people very much in their 30s and 40s and sometimes uh, early 50s. Uh, so you can start at any age, but it gets harder, uh, especially to be a truly first-time entrepreneur. So don't wait too long. Uh, at some the, the moment will never be right. So uh, if that's something that you truly want to do and uh, something where you do understand what kind of um, you know level of hardship you're signing up for, uh, and you will you really want to do this for all the right reasons, uh, which are because you want to uh, will a product and a company into the world, and not because you want to be part of the whole like you know venture and, and startup theater. Those are the bad reasons. Creating a, a product and a company are the right reasons. So if you want to do all this, don't wait too long. That's one part. The other part, uh, uh, which adds the nuance, is that you 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 also don't want to completely rush into it. Uh, so if you are very, very young, uh, you know, a teenager or in your early 20s, uh, yes, there is a lore uh, of, um, you know, people dropping out of college and launching companies. Uh, if you are in a personal and financial position to do it uh, and you have a burning, burning need to do it and a burning idea, uh, by all means, go do it. Uh, this is a wonderful, wonderful time to to do it. But there needs to be the the above. For most people, uh, you are better served having a little bit of experience of some sort. So maybe you spend a couple of years at uh, you know Facebook or some startup like coding and building and seeing what great looks like, seeing what mm -hmm. growth looks like, seeing what good processes. Uh, look like so that when you start the company not everything is brand new because the reality of, of running a company as a CEO is like yes you're going to spend the first few months or years just like building the product and coding and all the things but like very quickly you're going to find yourself to be the effectively the head of finance uh, and the head of uh, HR, which uh, pretty often means being the chief complaint officer, where you know suddenly people that be sometimes uh, older than you, if you start very young, will, will come to you and say, "Well, you know, Joe, Julie, uh, what is my career plan within this company? Like, what are the you know in my performance review? Like, how do I need to improve to make it to the next level? Like, all sorts of things that have nothing to do with coding and building." Uh, a technical product um, so you want to have a little bit of background that uh, professional experience that we're, we're not all those parts are going to be new that that that's certainly um, helpful and then you also ask the question of the co-founder so uh, here as well there could be a long conversation so I'll, I'll keep it I'll keep it quick but um, you know one um, I think Today, it's much more possible to start a company without a co-founder. Uh, if you're you know, a technical founder, which is, I guess, the, the, the people who listen to uh, this podcast primarily, 
um, it used to be that, uh, you know, that was like a no-no if you didn't have like another co-founder, uh, you know, with high complementarity, uh, that was, uh, you just like, couldn't do it. Um, now the world has evolved in a way where actually there's a bunch of companies started by solo founders. Uh, having said that, I don't know that I would necessarily recommend it, uh, if nothing else, because um, it's a very lonely journey out there. And if you build a successful company, you may be at it for 8, 10, 15 years. Uh, and that's a long journey to have that kind of weight on your shoulders for all this time. So having a co-founder uh, really helps. Uh, but then you want to have a great co-founder uh, because um, having a bad co-founder is a terrible way to live if you end up <laughs> uh, arguing and, 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 and all the things and just not seeing eye to eye. And, uh, uh, you know, you don't need to be best friends, but uh, you certainly need to have a common understanding of what's important and values and the same level of ambition and then you know, the same commitment to growing into the company and all the things. So uh, you probably do want to co-found it when you can and that, that you don't want to rush. Uh, so yes, you may have a burning desire to start a company, uh, but, you know, typically you don't want to start the company with that nice guy or gal you met at, mm -hmm. you know, data driven NYC over pizza and beer three weeks ago. Right. Right. You probably want to find people with whom you have some level of history, some level of commonality, uh, and um, uh, you know a little bit of shared history to make sure that you go into this um, eyes wide open. That's great. How do you um, how do you meet um, potential companies to invest in? How do you find these Series A and early stage companies? Yeah, so f for me, it's uh, a combination of inbound and outbound. You know, in some ways, not too dissimilarly from what we see our B2B companies uh, do. Uh, the really good thing is that I'm somewhat uh, specialized, right, around uh, enterprise and cloud investing with a particular predilection for data infrastructure, machine learning, and AI. So that uh, reduces the size uh, of the potential pool I'm looking at somewhat, uh, you know, at the same time, as per the MAD, uh, it's, it's a very large number, but it's not, it's not everything. You know, I mean, not, not that long ago, and I still to some extent uh, today, there's uh, a number of investors uh, that consider themselves more or less journalists. And I'm like, like how, do you, how, do you, how do you even... How is that even possible? Like, how do you, you know? Uh, so at least I'm like somewhat specialized. So that's large pool, but that's still like reasonably tractable. And then, um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I get uh, a lot of inbound, uh, both cold and through uh, people I've known one way or another, uh, you know, um, uh, including uh, the founders I work with or I have worked with in the past, uh, some of the best referrals, inbound referrals I ever got were, were from uh, founders I, I worked with. Um, and then, uh, you know, I do uh, some outbound as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 the market is reasonably efficient and somehow for the best companies or the companies that fit the most closely, the VC criteria, uh, whatever they are, uh, the market will tend to cluster towards those pretty mm -hmm. quickly and uh, people will get a lot of inbound if they correspond to that, uh, to that, what the market wants at, at that moment. So you have to do outbound as well. You know, the, the days of um, just waiting on your Sandy Hill Road office and waiting for the best entrepreneurs to be referred to you are long past. And certainly, you know, there's one thing that we all learned um, in the, or that was, became particularly evident in the last two or three years when the market was super hot is that, uh, you know, if you sit uh, on an opportunity, uh, you know, it will be, it will be gone before you have a, a chance to even meet the founder. So um, yeah, inbound and outbound. Let me ask you this. Um, and then I'm going to, I want to talk a little bit about the AI enterprise and cloud, plot, you know, space, but um the market's all over the place. There's a lot of debate about do as there dry powder, is it wet powder? What was the VC perspective? Um, and so just very simply, is this a good time or a bad time to start a company in your space, in the enterprise cloud and AI space? 
Yeah, look, I, I think that's a wonderful time. Um, I'll, 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 I'll I guess what has to be true? Yeah, what has to be true if you are going to do it? Yeah. So um, when I say it's a, it's a wonderful time, so so uh, again, I'll, I'll give the nuance in a, in a second. But like fundamentally, look, like all the cliches, uh, which I think are incredibly true. Um, first of all, uh, it's the mega trend of all mega trends, like this whole thing that at some point was called big data that has become data infrastructure and uh, ML and AI, which is, you know, in some ways a different world, but uh, very closely intertwined with data infrastructure. Uh, look, that that's the mega trend um, of the last few years, and certainly for the you know years ahead, and perhaps the most important of all, in in my opinion. Um, and if you think of the you know history of computing, the PC, the internet, and mobile and social, uh, you know there was a little bit of a head fake around Web three crypto, which I, I do think is interesting, but uh, you know at least for now has not panned out the way people were hoping. I think this trend of like big data machine learning AI is like the of the same magnitude as as cloud and mobile and um, you know the internet and blah blah blah. Um, so uh, in those categories. Absolutely wonderful um, place to be as an entrepreneur. So that's one. Two, uh, you know, you'll hear every VC say that. And again, it's a little bit of a cliche, but uh, some of the best companies were created in tough market conditions. Uh, and, um, you know, there are uh, pros and cons to every situation. But yes, it is harder to start a company now because venture capital money is uh, flowing a little less or maybe a lot less than it used to a couple of years ago. At the same time, um, there's a little bit of a self, um, sort of it's a little, left, little bit of a self-selecting pool. Uh, you know, starting a company now, you truly have to really want it because it's much more difficult. And then the people that join you I'm much more likely to have that spirit of like, okay, well, maybe I could hang out um, at, at at Google as a you know employee uh, seventy five thousand, uh, but like instead I'm gonna go into like a little bit of an uncomfortable little boat like in the rough sea. <laughs> so like the kind of people that are willing to do that are typically the right people, the people that you do want in a in a startup. Um, and also, by the way, those people are now available uh, in a way that uh, is much more true than was the case, you know, two or three years ago, where like anybody that was uh, reasonably good would get, uh, you know, offers and pings on a daily basis. Um, so, yes, it is a wonderful time to uh, start all of this, you know, at the same time. Yes, uh, there, the, it's, there are difficulties. Um, uh, the you know venture financing is much less abundant and and, and all the things. Anyway, asking about dry powder versus wet powder, so that's a little bit of a like a hard. Uh, oh, you don't you almost don't like to... math. Yeah. No, but like, it's, you know it's 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 a little bit of like a hard math question. Like everybody's uh, asking, it's like okay, on the one hand. Uh, you know, the market seems frozen and there's just like not a lot of deals happening and we had like historical lows for the last 10 years. But like on the other hand, VC firms have raised literally billions of dollars, like billions and billions and billions of dollars. And, you know, for a while, there seemed to be like an announcement every day, just like our friends at Bain announced like a multi-billion dollar fund just like yesterday. So like, okay, well, how, how is that possible that on the one hand, you have like tons of dry powder and like on the other hand, you have a bunch of companies that want that money and cannot get it uh, j j just yet. Um, and I think the, the short version of, a man, of my answer there, and again, there's a bunch of nuances, is that the way to think about it is not total dry powder, but dry powder per year. Uh, and what that means is that uh, in the last uh, two or three years, in particular when the market was super hot, uh, tons of money was deployed uh, on, a, uh, on, a, on a yearly basis uh, in a context where funds were raised uh, in theory to last three years, but in reality were deployed in a year. So at a much more accelerated deployment. I think what happens now is that um, if you think of the average timeline for deployment of a fund to be around three years, I think what's happening right now is that we're overcorrecting. So instead of saying, hey, we're gonna do three, but we already deploy in one, uh, now VCs are effectively saying, hey, we said three, but that might be you know four or five. 
Uh, so yes, there's tons of dry powder, but it doesn't mean that on an annual basis right now this year and maybe next year, uh, all those fonts are going to get deployed anywhere near the speed at which they were deployed in the prior two or three years. So it's slightly less frenzied. I always tell people that there's always a, a lot less frenzy. There's always money for great ideas, right? Um, yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. It's it's harder to get, uh, but uh, but uh, for sure. I know we're kind of coming close to the end here, so I wanted to make sure to ask you. Um, what areas of like in your space in your domain? What areas of technology are you looking at? What companies are that that you can share? Are you looking at that you think are the most interesting? Uh, so a little bit all of the above uh, with some nuances. So again, I think uh, data infrastructure um, and machine learning and AI, whether at the core infrastructure level, at the analytics level, or at the application level. That's from my perspective, that's a gift that keeps on giving, right? So that's the general uh, general answer. Now, at a, at a more specific uh, level, I think there's a little bit of a um, uh, little bit of a different situation in the world of data infrastructure versus the world of machine learning and AI. I think data infrastructure is um, at a stage of digestion. Uh, which has uh, started over the last few months and is likely to last for another couple of years. And what I mean by that is that, um, especially in the wake of the Snowflake IPO, which was this completely you know blockbuster IPO, and Snowflake being like, the most highly valued um, software company and the uh, biggest software IPO ever, uh, that plus COVID plus low interest rates uh, created a frenzy of uh, company creation and investment in data infrastructure. So you have like all those categories, uh, ELT, TL, reverse ETL, uh, metric stores, um, you know, data analyst uh, platforms, uh, semantic, what have you, data quality, data observability, uh, all of that just um, had a, a just this super exciting wave of uh, just stuff happening. Uh, but fast forward to today, uh, you have just uh, a million and a half companies doing all those things. And, um, you know, it's it's unclear and probably unlikely that the market can sustain this many companies. So we are in a phase where uh, companies are going to start separating. There's uh, going to be companies that are, uh, for whatever reason, they raise more money, they're executing better, they have better management, whatever, are going to start truly emerging as a category leader. And I think for the companies in those categories that are not the category leader or this maybe the second best company, things are going to get increasingly tougher. Um, and the moment of, of reckoning has not really happened because so many of those companies have raised so much money that they have cash for the next like couple of years. But like at some point, people are going to start uh, running out of cash, except if they get uh, to profitability. So what's likely to happen as that happens is either a series of down rounds uh, or more likely a bunch of like consolidation and all the things. So... Uh, to your question, I, I don't know that starting a data uh, observability not to become them because I do think that's a very interesting <laughs> category uh, is the you know the, the right thing to do at the second, except if you have like a very different point of view and a different strategy and blah blah blah. Um, I think the world of machine learning and AI on the other end is um, uh, just uh, having its moment, and you know, look, like, there's been like two or three hype cycles in AI uh, just in the last ten years. Uh, but there's certainly like plenty to do there, and it's sort of like right now it's like party like it's 1999, which um, right? most people are not going to get the <laughs> reference to the Prince song. Um, but um, that's unfortunate. But uh, that's unfortunate. But that's how you know you like to be on a certain age, so it's like when you start. Uh, they take just a couple so. more minutes. Yes, um, I did have a question about that because I'm truly curious. Um, I was, you know, also lived through a couple of these AI winters. I started on natural language processing, and now we have all these LLMs. It's very the new hotness. That's great. I'm super psyched about it. But then I've always always worked in these very large enterprise environments. So I guess my question is, what I know what ChatGPT looks like to me as a consumer messing around, but what's it going to look like when companies start adopting, like, you know, your Geico's of the world or your, you know... Um, Chase Bank, like, what's it going to look like, do you think? Yeah, I, th- I think it's going to look, um, you know, very much the same, but just uh, better. Um, so we, um, the, the concept of, of chat is, is not 
new. Uh, and in fact, if you think about like the um, hype cycles over the last few years, uh, for me, there was like a big hype cycle around like 2012, 13, 14. So like in the wake of like oh, deep learning, you know, becoming a thing, uh, like how it performed in 2012, even though it was a very, you know, old uh, kind of like framework and algorithm. Uh, you know, there's like this whole wave of excitement around, oh, what you can do with deep learning, which, you know, is what's happening today um, is very much a continuation of. So that was one. And then the second hype cycle was like 20, sort of 14 and 15. And that was precisely around chatbots. Like everybody is like, I don't know if you remember, like everybody was like crazy about like chatbots and all those things. And like generative mm -hmm. AI is like the next, um, the next iteration of this. So the, the concept of chatbot is not new. There's a bunch of chatbots, um, you know, for the Chase and the Geico's of, of the world. The big difference is, um, uh, you know, with uh, open AI and generative AI, it, it's just going to be at a level of just like quality uh, and precision that was, uh, that, that will be uh, considerably enhanced as long as they don't, hallucinate, which is like a whole uh, separate um, kind of thing. But, uh, you know, to be the VC that plugs um, one of the companies, I'm a proud uh, investor and board member in um, a company called Ada, which is pretty much the market leader uh, for uh, chatbots and automated customer experience, uh, which is an AI company um, at, it, at, it, at its core. Uh, and uh, they announced a um, few weeks ago that they had built this partnership with OpenAI where, uh, you know, we certainly have a, our own models that are homegrown, uh, but we're going to also add some uh, part of a GPT, um, you know, GPT-3 for now, GPT-4 uh, later, that are, that's going to enable us to just take the quality of the chatbot to... Uh, you know, to that proverbial uh, next level, but it's uh, it's very it's very much um, it's very much happening. Interesting. All right. Well, I only have one last question for you, if you're willing to answer. It's a little bit of a fun one, hopefully. Um, I see in the background you have a uh, mural of some kind of large picture. Um, yes. I'm going to guess what that is, and then you tell me. <laughs> yes, yes, and I can I can move the camera. As I'm going to say um, it's uh, Proust or um, Groucho Marx. So the grand reveal. Oh, it's that guy. <laughs> yeah, yes. It's like the Madrid thing. It makes so, sense. It's abstract. I, I like it. Yeah, and look, look I mean, it's, it's sort of like a... So this is actually... Uh, I don't know, people that, that see this in the... Here, here the podcast will not see, but that's the, the that's the like the, the, the man with the apple in his face. And that's actually drawn on the wall. Oh. So this is a, this is a, uh, you know, a, 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 what is it called? Like a, a wall, yeah. you know, you can like, um, what's the word? Like a whiteboard kind of, uh -huh. like, kind of surface. So like some, like an artist actually drew this and, you know, luckily the reason for this was, um, like the inspiration. Behind, so first of all, I've always liked, um, uh, this, uh, and, and, and second, there was always a little bit of like, you know, stay intrigued. And things don't always things are not always uh, what they look like. So it's sort of that kind of thing. So I don't know if it's cheesy or not, but like I always liked it, and I like the you know yeah being intrigued, being curious, and things may not be what they appear, which I think gels well with the general ethos of venture capital, not to say yeah, no, too self-aggrandizing. A good a good venture capitalist should be the guy in a suit. Was something unexpected? <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> thankfully, we, we, we no longer have to wear suits, but um, well, but certainly being 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 curious um, uh, is at the heart of, of what we do. And I think the the second you stop being curious and believing in things being different, and start you know being jaded and you know that will never work. That's probably when you should be thinking of a different job. That's right. I think that's a great note to wrap it up. Um, Matt Turk, thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Um, really look forward to, um, I guess you need some rest time, but the next, you know, I'm going to really get involved with the math yes. and then <laughs> the next one, <laughs> we'll see in a couple of years. Yeah, no, th thank you so much. And look, I hope this uh, mad effort, like in addition to giving uh, us a chance, you and I to, to chat today, something that people will We'll check out so again, uh, you know, to be the again the VC that plugs uh, mm -hmm. his own work. Um, you know, people should go on my blog. So it's mattturk.com, M A T T T U R C K. So three T's, M A T T T U R C K dot com, uh, and uh, it's a slash mad twenty twenty three. But if you go to my blog, that's the first article that's on there. And then again, we have this uh, interactive version that lives on the first mark website at mad. 
uh, mad.firstmarkcap.com, uh, which uh, hopefully is a good experience uh, for people to play with. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm very interested and open to feedback. Um, a big reason why I do this is... Um, because uh, I want it to be uh, a starting point for a conversation. So I think you alluded to, you know, you may disagree with um, how a company is categorized in some ways. So first of all, we obviously try very hard to uh, for that not to happen and we try to be as accurate as possible. Uh, but the, the broader point is, um, you know, people disagreeing and having thoughts and giving feedback is very much uh, actually the reason why we do it. Uh, we want this to be a, a conversation, and the the overall overarching ethos is is really an open source effort. I could be doing a variation of this and just you know uh, keep it for myself and do it internally and just like share among the investors at First Mark, which by the way. Uh, in some ways would give us a little more of an edge uh, compared to the people that don't do the work. But the decision is to open source uh, the effort and have this again uh, as a community-driven approach where uh, where we think that uh, we gain a lot more through the interaction with folks uh, in terms of like knowledge and connections and uh, insights than we would if we kept uh, our cards close to the best. I love that. That's exactly right. I love that whole ethos of um, putting something out there and having an opinion and getting feedback. That is the agile open source of a way of doing things. Um, and especially now with so many companies in the mix, it's very, very difficult to um, understand by yourself. Um, yeah. So really appreciate that. We'll put links to Data Driven New York, to the MAD and your website, uh, and maybe a, a link to the artwork you have on your wall as well. Um, <laughs> yes. Sorry, so excuse my voice. Um, it's always a pleasure to catch up with you. Thank you so much for the time, and we'll talk soon. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.